I wish very much that the wrong people could be prevented entirely from breeding. The human life is sacred only when it may be of some use to itself and to the world. Facilitation of the process of weeding out the unfit and of preventing the birth of defectives. Still empty, that's all. They sterilize me. What do you think I'm worth? What do you think I'm worth? In 1927, the United States Supreme Court issued the opinion Buck v. Bell, upholding the legality of the sterilization of Carrie Buck under Virginia's Eugenical Sterilization Act of 1924. By legitimizing the use of similar sterilization laws across the U.S. and shifting the focus of sterilization towards women, Buck v. Bell served as a turning point in the American eugenics movement and endorsed the U.S. government's control over the bodily autonomy of lesser citizens through state regulation. The eugenics movement, beginning in the late 19th century in the United Kingdom, was based on the theory that the human race could be biologically improved by eliminating those deemed lesser by society, the physically and mentally disabled, criminals, the mentally ill, people of color, sexually deviant people, etc. Francis Galton, the founder of the eugenics movement, introduced the idea that abstract social traits are hereditary. He wrote of eugenics, what nature does blindly, slowly, and ruthlessly, man may do providently, quickly, and kindly. The obvious prejudices that the eugenics movement was built upon were disguised by the illusion of credible science and research. Mendelian genetics, which had been recently hypothesized in 1865 and recognized within the scientific community, became the basis for eugenics theory of hereditary social traits. Key figures in the movement included Francis Galton, Charles Davenport, and Madison Grant. They promoted eugenics as a science by conducting experiments and social surveys, writing academic books and journals, establishing eugenic organizations, and holding international conferences. Eugenics was readily accepted in America, where pre-existing nativist and white supremacist sentiment was popular, due to an influx of immigration from Eastern and Southern Europe and Asia in the early 1900s. Eugenic pioneers targeted immigration and miscegenation, interracial marriage or sexual relationships, through legislation such as the Immigration Act of 1924 and Virginia's Racial Integrity Act of 1924. This work was supported by funding from philanthropic organizations founded by major titans of industry, such as the Carnegie Institution for Science and the Rockefeller Foundation. Another method of societal purification was forced sterilization, which left individuals incapable of sexual reproduction through surgery. In addition to the immigrants and people of color that previous eugenic legislation had targeted, early sterilization incorporated other undesirables, such as male criminals and the mentally ill, who were increasingly institutionalized in mental hospitals and asylums. Within these institutions, many individuals received false diagnoses for exhibiting supposed symptoms such as promiscuity, alcoholism, and poverty. According to Adam Cohen, the purpose of institutionalization was to remove a group deemed to be a threat and to segregate them, lock them up in secure facilities where they could not reproduce. These so-called feeble-minded people became prime targets for the eugenical sterilization movement. Dr. Albert Priddy, the first superintendent of the Virginia Colony for Epileptics, was a firm supporter of eugenics and practitioner of forced sterilizations in the years leading up to Buck v. Bell, acting under loose interpretations of pre-existing laws. Worried about the legality of a sterilization program, Priddy advocated for the passage of a sterilization law in Virginia, resulting in the Eugenical Sterilization Act of 1924. He also decided to use a test case to validate its legality in court, the case of Carrie Buck. Carrie Buck was born in 1906 and moved to foster care when she was three. Her biological mother, Emma Buck, was committed to the Virginia Colony for Epileptics in 1920, as she was deemed a low-grade moron for having a child out of wedlock. After Carrie became pregnant in 1923 as a result of a rape committed by a relative of her foster family, her foster parents had her moved to the same colony for her promiscuous behavior. Upon learning about Carrie and her daughter Vivian, Pretty realized he had the perfect test case to prove the hereditary nature of feeble-mindedness and the merits of sterilization. He successfully petitioned the colony board for authorization to sterilize Carrie and then recruited his close friend and former member of the colony board, Irving Whitehead, to challenge the decision and represent Carrie in court. During the trial, Whitehead made no attempt to challenge the questionable scientific claims made by the prosecution, and neglected to call any witnesses or contact Carrie's teachers, who could have provided documentary evidence of her average academic performance. To strengthen Pretty's case by proving that mental illness appeared in three generations, Vivian was diagnosed as feeble-minded as well upon her failure to track the movement of a coin held in front of her face. Carrie lost both at trial court and after appeal to the Supreme Court. On May 22, 1927, the Supreme Court declared Carey's sterilization constitutional in an 8-1 ruling. In his majority opinion, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes concluded that, 
it is better for all the world if, instead of waiting to execute degenerate offspring for crime or to let them starve for their imbecility, society can prevent those who are manifestly unfit from continuing their kind. Three generations of imbeciles are enough. The Supreme Court's decision in Buck v. Bell had exactly the effect that Pretty desired. In this way, it was a turning point, increasing sterilization rates drastically across the nation. In the 1930s, sterilization rates in Virginia rose to their highest levels, approximately 13 sterilizations per 100,000 state residents. By the early 1930s, 30 states had adopted eugenic sterilization laws, many modeled after Virginia's, up from only 9 in 1914. State Supreme Courts, such as those of Kansas and Idaho, cited Buck v. Bell in their decisions to uphold eugenic laws. Buck v. Bell was also a turning point in that it shifted the gender of those targeted by forced sterilizations disproportionately towards women. Through Buck v. Bell, the Supreme Court gave approval to the framework of Virginia's law, where those in institutions could be sterilized. Institution superintendents at the time were facing issues under due process laws, on the grounds that victims did not have proper opportunities to protest the procedure. However, the Supreme Court's decision in Buck v. Bell ruled that Virginia's Eugenical Sterilization Act addressed this issue by adding procedural safeguards. In response to this and other rulings on the necessity of due process, superintendents began obtaining consent for the procedure. However, this acted to increasingly target women for sterilization, as due to their status as dependents, their consent could be granted by husbands or parents. They say they obtained consent. Does that mean that the patient knew what was going to happen, that they knew the full implications of what was going to happen, like the alternatives, the risks, the benefits, and that they sort of voluntarily gave their permission? No. Additional legal issues also led to increased focus on women. Due to accusations of forced sterilization being cruel and unusual punishment, male criminals, once prime targets of sterilization, became protected under state court rulings such as Mikkel v. Henricks in 1918. However, this did little to prevent the sterilization of women who were generally sterilized as a result of perceived flaws such as promiscuity. By 1942, 67% of people sterilized in institutions were female, up from 47% in 1927. Following Hitler's actions during World War II, many Americans distanced themselves from the eugenics movement, but the practice of forced sterilizations persisted. Though 15 states repealed their sterilization laws between 1965 and 1979, federally funded sterilizations occurred under the banner of family planning programs in the 60s and 70s, with a continued focus on poor women of color. An infamous example was Ralph E. Weinberger in 1973. Mary Alice Ralph and Minnie Lee Ralph, two African-American sisters, were sterilized in a federally funded family planning clinic in Alabama without proper consent. Their illiterate mother had given permission for her daughters to receive birth control shots by signing a piece of paper with an X. Another example is the 1978 case of Madre Galvi Quilligan, in which 10 Mexican-American women filed a class action lawsuit against the Los Angeles County USC Medical Center for sterilizing them without proper consent. Despite this malpractice, the California Federal Court ruled in favor of the medical center, citing miscommunication due to a language barrier. These cases are only two examples of the many sterilizations that occurred even after explicitly eugenic rhetoric had left the mainstream. Buck v. Bell left women, especially those belonging to marginalized groups, vulnerable. The use of forced sterilization on vulnerable women continues even today. As late as 2020, a whistleblower revealed that migrant women in a U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Center in Georgia were being subject to unnecessary hysterectomies. Detainee Karina Cisneros Preciado recalled her experience, receiving what she was told was treatment for an ovarian cyst. It gives me the shot on my arm and makes me sign a paper, which I don't, I didn't have a chance to read it or hold it. I was wearing handcuffs. I just signed it. I didn't know what it was. Uh, it, was it wasn't explained to me. That's when I learned it was birth control. Buck v. Bell continues to be cited in modern law. In 2001, Margaret Vaughn and her husband, Kevin Vaughn, sued three social workers in the case of Vaughn v. Ruoff. Margaret was mentally disabled and had been pressured into being sterilized as a condition for regaining custody of her children from the state. The Court of Appeals ruled in favor of Vaughn, but stated that involuntary sterilization could be legal if the due process standards established in Buck v. Bell were followed. While some state governments, such as Virginia, North Carolina, and California, have issued apologies and set up reparation programs for living survivors of forced sterilization, the 70,000 victims of these sterilizations can never be properly compensated for the violation and loss they endured. Ultimately, Buck v. Bell was an endorsement of these marginalized people suffering from a government that believed it necessary to regulate and invade their bodies. Were you very sad? Yeah, I'm sad, because obviously I want to eat children. Buck v. Bell has never been overturned.